Shall we rise up for prayer? We need to praise the name of the Lord for granting us journey mercies here, for making this Congress a possibility, and for giving us great expectation as we come together. I tried from the beginning. It will be the desire of your heart that the Lord will speak to your heart. That great will be the outpouring of His Spirit upon your life. In Jesus' name we pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for journey mercies. We thank you because of your protection over your children, over your servants, that were brought from the west and from the east and from the southern part, from the central part of Africa. Thank you because of those who have come from outside Africa too. Thank you for those of us who are in Nigeria here and you have granted us journey mercies here. We know you have a purpose for bringing us together. And we glorify you because you have this great mighty plan for every life. And for the ministry that you have committed into every hand. We pray that you accept our praises in Jesus' name. Lord, as we come together, we want your plan, your purpose to be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that every opportunity we have to listen to your word through this place, on this pulpit, that your word will come straight from the throne above, right into the hearts of all your people in Jesus' name. We pray that you protect our hearts so that nothing will distract us. Nothing will distort the truth we hear in our hearts. And nothing will lead us astray to anything which is not your perfect revelation through your word in Jesus' name. We have come here not only because we want to be spiritually refreshed, but because we represent thousands and millions of people in the various nations we represent. And therefore, Lord, we pray that you will so prepare our hearts and lives, prepare our ministries, so that when we go back to the various places we came from, we'll be able to deliver your truth, your revelation, unto all the people that are waiting for us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that things that are just by the way. The things that are not essential, that the devil would like to magnify in our mind, that you will take every one of those things away from us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you make us real overcomers, that as we're here in body, we'll be here in spirit as well, that we'll not allow a judge or a title of your word to fall to the ground. But your word will sink deep in every heart in Jesus' name. From this very night, begin to speak to your people. Throughout the Congress, speak to your people. All through our days together here, let us hear you. May what we hear be of benefit to every heart. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. I want to formally welcome every one of you to this year's Congress. And I want to assure you that 
it is not an accident that you are here. I believe that God has a purpose for making it possible for you to be here. And I pray that the purpose of God, which you may not know its extent, its depth, and its height, will be fulfilled as you attend this Congress in Jesus' name. We praise the name of the Lord for journey mercies. For everyone here, being here is the very plan of God. And we know that this ought to accomplish a very definite purpose in your life. We've called it Leadership Strategy Congress. You know, as I know, that leadership is very essential to the ministry of the church. That is why we've counted it something important at the headquarters church here to leave no stone unturned and to spend virtually all that we have to prepare so that we'll be able to make this strategy congress a possibility. The church can only be as strong as its leadership. That is why leadership development through such an annual congress like this is so very important. The composite roles of us as leaders demand that we come together frequently to the divine fount to be renewed. When I talk of the composite roles of leaders, I'm talking about what the scripture reveals that the leader is a shepherd, is a servant, is God's spokesman, is the sower of the seed. Is the strengthener of the saints, a soul winner among sinners. And when you consider such composite roles that a leader has to play, you see the very necessity that you'll come together like this with other people of God so that you receive strength at the fountain of the Lord. The health of the leader determines the health of the church. If the leader is sick, the church will be sick. If the leader is weak, the church will be weak. If the leader is unstable, the church will be unstable. If the leader is ignorant, the church will be ignorant. If the leader is compromising, the church will be compromising. The fire, the vision, the knowledge, the conviction, the anointing of the leader have direct bearing on the spiritual stage and growth of the church. As Israel could not rise above the spiritual condition of her priests and kings, so the church today cannot rise above the conviction and the commitment of her teachers, pastors, and leaders. That's why we count it very essential that all of us who are leaders will give up this whole week and leave everything, push everything aside, and come to receive from the Lord alone. And we are believing that as we're coming together, even from tonight, you receive strength from the Lord. And remember, you are receiving from the Lord as a representative of the church of the living God. As you have seen, the title of this post message in the Congress is Life and Power for God's End Time Army. You are preachers yourself. And you know that every word in that title is very important. What could you do without life, spiritual life, eternal life, the very life of Christ? What could you do in your church, in your leadership role, without power, spiritual power, heavenly power, anointing, power to preach, to teach, and to do the work of the Lord? When we talk about end time army. The Bible calls us soldiers of Christ. And in our 
being together as a group, like a battalion, we form an army. And this obviously is the end time. So we need life, we need power, so that we'll be able to march ahead and do the things we ought to do. Revivals and renewals do not come without God's people seeking his face with total abandonment. New anointing or new power cannot come, will not come to the lukewarm without a definite desire, without an uncommon consecration, without fervent praying. For a kind of revival that is as miraculous as the resurrection of the dead, we need God's word and fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God. And the Lord has preserved the word for us in Ezekiel chapter 37, from verse 1 all through to verse 14. This should be a familiar passage to every one of us. Ezekiel chapter 37, from verse 1 through to verse 14. Open your Bible with me. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the, the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Let's stop there for a moment. That furnishes us Instructive illustration on God's desire and plan of action for bringing life and power to his end time army, for end time ministry and mission. There is a lot in the book of Ezekiel, and there is a lot in the life of Ezekiel. There is a lot to learn from the condition of the children of Israel at the time of Ezekiel. There is a lot to learn from this particular passage we have read together. And probably will not be able to scale the height and fathom the depth of what we have in that short passage I've read to you. As students of the Bible, you ought to know that that passage of the Bible has an historic fulfillment. If you look at the history of the children of Israel, 
you will see very clearly the description, the illustration we have in that passage. And yet there is a prophetic note here. If you look at this story very well or at this passage very well, you will see as you look into the future, the prophetic thing that talked about the children of Israel, how eventually they'll be gathered together like dead, dry, scattered, dismembered bones. If you look at it from the eschatological point of view, that is, you are studying the last things to come. And you look at Israel, and you look at the covenant of the Lord, the plan of the Lord, the eschatology, the study of the last things concerning the children of Israel. You will see very clearly here, marked out the plan of God for the children of Israel, for the days to come. Yet, if you look at it spiritually, and you look at the application to the church of the living God, the church as a whole, the church in this generation in which we live, you will see the application, the relevance of this passage to the church today. But let's see how the Lord opens up the passage to you and to me. Why don't we just consider three points. Number one, spiritual death and dryness. Spiritual death and dryness. Number two, great need for Ezekiel's today. The great need for Ezekiel's today. As we look at the book of Ezekiel itself and the time, the era, the period that Ezekiel came to minister to the children of Israel, and you see the various things that are said about the spiritual life of Ezekiel. And you study through, you will know that what we're looking for today and what we need today is an Ezekiel in every community. And wouldn't it be a new thing in this new year as we come together, this week of January, if we will just plead with the Lord that he'll make every one of us as we're seated here, Make you an Ezekiel in your community. He can do it. I said he can do it. And if you will wait upon the Lord and pray unto the Lord and say, Lord, I've heard the call. I've seen the need. I've seen the problem. And I see the solution is you, God, raising up a man like Ezekiel in my own community. He can do it. And when he does it, dry bones will come alive. Point number three, raising up an end time army. No Ezekiel can do it all alone. No Ezekiel, however anointed, energized, empowered, ambitioned, emboldened, can do it alone. No Ezekiel, whatever revelation he sees, whatever vision he has, no Ezekiel can do it alone. Ezekiel has to prophesy and speak to these bones. Ezekiel has to prophesy and speak to the wind. They're presenting, depicting the spirit of God to come upon the slain, upon the dead ones, so that they'll come alive and an army will be raised up. Point three, raising up an end time army. Let's go back to point one. A dryness first before the refreshing. The pitiable condition first before the showers of blessing. And the description of the children of Israel defeated, destroyed, desolate, dismembered. Before we find the unity, the coming together, the life, the revival, the renewal that came upon them. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 37 and look at this from verse 1. Spiritual death and dryness. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down at, in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And it caused me to pass by, pass by them, round about, not walk on them. 
not trample on them, not make their conditions worse. He just made me to pass by them round about. What a message. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? That question will be coming to you as you hear the word of God. The Spirit of God will be bringing that question to you. He'll be asking you, these bones in your community, where you come from, can these bones live? If God is going to make use of you in any way, as a man or as a woman, you will have to give an answer. You might have to give an answer in tears. You might have to give an answer on your knees. You might have to give an answer with deep stirring of your heart. But God will need an answer from you. Son of man, can these bones live? Verse 11. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. The valley of dry bones was an appropriate picture of Israel at the time of Ezekiel. I told you already four things about them. One, they were defeated. Other prophets have talked about that. And they have told the children of Israel that the way they were living, they were deviating from the covenant of the Lord. They were not obedient to the will of the Lord. That danger was coming. That defeat will come upon them. By the time of Ezekiel, it had come. Number two, they were destroyed. The land destroyed. Property destroyed. Name destroyed. The kingdom destroyed. They were desolate. The fruitful land had become desolate. Not only that, for they were dismembered. The United Nation had been scattered. What I mean is Israel that had been united before. Under one single leadership, the leadership of the God of heaven, these people had been divided, dismembered, and scattered. If you look at them in various ways, number one, look at them politically. They were ruined and oppressed. They were no more the people that were ruling, that were reigning, that were living by the privilege of the covenant. So politically, they were completely ruined. Morally, they were based, they were corrupt, like the heathens, like the pagans. In fact, you find in various parts of Ezekiel, and you find in various parts of Jeremiah too, the condition, the moral condition of the children of Israel, so low, so corrupt. It's like they never knew God in their lifestyle, behavior, and conduct. What do we talk about? Their economy. Economically, at this particular time, at the time of Ezekiel, they were in abject poverty. When you think about them spiritually, they were already separated from God and separated from the favor of God. Nationally, they were in a state of disintegration and exile. That was the condition of the children of Israel. At the time, Ezekiel came to minister to them. You might look at this nation. And you might think of the politics. Think of the morals. Think of the economy. Think of the spiritual aspect. Think of the national identity. And you will find the same thing that you find at the time of Ezekiel. 
there was real problem that the Lord had to be asking Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? I want you to think about the nation you come from, whether in Africa or outside Africa. Think about that nation politically. How is it? Think about it morally. How is it? Think about it economically. How is it? Think about it spiritually too. And think about it nationally. And see the condition. You see it any better than what we have read together here concerning the children of Israel at this time of Ezekiel? And so as you see the condition of the nation you represent, the Lord is asking you the question, can these bones live? As we talk about the different nations, why don't we bring them together? And think of the world in which we live. There is some precedented uncertainty with rapid changes in the world right now. And multiplicity of ethnic conflicts in the world of today. Do you know that in this world in which we live now, poor nations are becoming poorer? And there is increase in famine, increase in disease. In most parts of the world, the vast majority of the population are separated from God and they are separated from one another, one tribe separated from the other. Occultism is widespread. Nominalism is prevalent. There is spiritual death and dryness all over the world. The question then comes to you, as we are here tonight, can these bones live? If God is going to do anything through you to make a change, a transformation in the community in which you live, in the world in which you live, you will have to give an answer to that question. What will your answer be? An answer of despondency? No hope. An answer of unbelief? No God. An, ans an answer of despair? Nothing can be done. An answer of just giving up, saying nothing can be done. You can't really preach anything in this community in which we live. In the world in which we live now, can you even preach? How can you even survive yourself? Or is your answer going to be the answer of faith? Knowing that with God, all things are possible. And knowing that the same God that spoke to Ezekiel and predicted and prophesied that a change was coming, he is able to bring that change about. We we'll talked about the world. Let me just talk briefly about Africa. Africa is a big valley where hundreds of millions are spiritually dead and millions are dying every year. Of the 500 million people in Africa, only 13% profess to be evangelical. Not all those 13% are born again, mind you, but only those 13% even profess to be evangelical. What are the rest of the people, 87% of Africa, or do they fit into idol worshippers, traditionalists, occultists, nominal churchgoers, and other kinds of people that do not know, that have not discovered yet the way to heaven. Do you know that in Africa of the 1,800 languages spoken in Africa, 1,800, only 107 have the complete Bible in their language. Of the 1,800, only 100 and seven have the complete Bible in their language, Africa. Big valley of dead bones. Of the world's 40 poorest nations, 32 are in Africa alone. And how many nations are there in Africa? That you have of the 40 poorest nations in Africa, 32 in uh, Africa. 
Do you know that if you think of all the earnings, the income generated all over the world, only 1.2% of the income of the whole world comes from Africa. Massive people, many people, poor people, wretched people. Spiritually, where is Africa? Economically, where is, where is Africa? Millions face death through starvation because of war in Africa, because of drought in Africa, because of famine. And there is a multiplicity and the proliferation of indigenous syncretic movements incorporating some elements of Christianity and traditional religions. Most towns and villages in Africa do not have Bible-believing churches. How do you describe Africa? It's a big valley of dead, dry bones. And here we are, representing Africa. And the Lord asking us, look at Africa very well. Look at it economically. Look at it spiritually. Look at it morally. Look at it in every way. Can these bones live? I challenge you to look at your community. I challenge you to look at your region. I challenge you to look at your nation. What is the spiritual condition of the people? What do you see? Sin of every kind. Unbelief. Violence. Wickedness. Idolatry. Materialism. Rebellion. Conflicts. Fornication. Adultery. Prostitution. Drunkenness. Murders. Evil. The list has no end. And the Lord is asking you and asking me, can these bones live? Think about this. Some hundreds of years ago, the same question came to Martin Luther. And the world then was just in a pitiable condition. No evangelical truth, no truth of being born again. No light, no fire, no anointing, no power. And everything was dark, bleak spiritually. And a question must have come to Martin Luther, son of man, Martin Luther, can these bones live? Thank God he gave the right answer. But he gave the answer not with words, he gave the answer with life and commitment. It came to the time of John Wesley. Again, England was very bad, very backward, spiritually down, dead, dry, dark. Again, the question came, as John Wesley looked at the whole of England, he looked at the church of England, the people that were supposed to, to be serving God, and he looked at Oxford, where he went to school. He was sorrowful. And again, the question must have come to him again. Can these bones live? He looked at the whole world, and if you have read his journals, or you have read the history of uh, John Wesley, you will know that he was shaking to the very marrow, to the very depth of his heart. Once again, he answered the question. And he answered the question, not with words. He answered it with consecration, to be a man of one goal, a man of one book, a man that will fear nothing but sin, and a man that will consider the whole world as his parish. History has put it on record. He did something. The time of Charles G. Finney. He went to a particular church when he was young. And he saw that the people, the way they were praying, they didn't even, they didn't pray as if they really believed in God. Again, conditions, things were very, very bad. The question came to him again, son of man, can these bones live? He answered, not with words. He answered by giving up his profession as a lawyer. He answered by giving up his very life. He answered by, by turning his, his face against every form of pleasure. He answered by saying, O oh Lord, here am I, use me. He changed his own community. They answered with their lives. The question comes to you today, son of man, can these bones 
live? How are you going to respond? They responded and millions came alive in regeneration, revival, and renewal. It has come to your turn. If you do not answer, if you do not respond, millions may die. And you may die for them. Because the Lord will require their blood in your hand. Son of man. Son of man. Can these bones live? Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37, verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. O Lord God, thou knowest. O Lord God, thou knowest. Think about that. Thou knowest. Don't we know? I think we know. If we look at the Bible, if we look at the fact that the children of Israel were in the land of captivity, and Pharaoh thought they will never be able to escape. Oh, we know. God made them to escape. If we look at the children of Israel under the Assyrians, God brought them out. If we look at the children of Israel in the intertestament period, God eventually brought Christ to them. And even as we look at Israel in those ages or in those years when they were all scattered about, now they are settled on their land and some of the prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. And of course, when you go to Revelation and you see that all nations, all tongues, all kindreds, all languages, they will praise the name of the Lord. Where will those people be coming from? They'll be coming from all over the world, you know, all through those ages. Because the Lord knows he can bring them alive. We know. From scripture, we know. From the power of God, we know. We know that if we will surrender ourselves and yield ourselves, the Lord is able to make use of us so that the bones will live. What then is the need? That leads me to point number two. Great need for Ezekiel's today. The Lord addressed Ezekiel. And he addressed him as an individual. And he wanted Ezekiel to confess whether God had the power to make the bones to live. And Ezekiel confessed. And Ezekiel then was charged or challenged to prophesy and speak to the bones, and then speak to the wind. I said our great need is for Ezekiel's today. But you may not know about Ezekiel very much. Why don't I just run you through some references in Ezekiel, so that you will know about Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 3. Very quickly. Ezekiel 1, 3, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river of Keba. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. You see Ezekiel there, the word of the Lord came to him, and the, Lord, the hand of the Lord was upon him. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 2. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him that spake unto me. That's Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was upon him. The word of the Lord came unto him. The Spirit of the Lord entered into him. The Lord spoke to him face to face, mouth to mouth. The Lord set him upon his feet. And then he said, I heard him when he spoke unto me. Chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Thou son of man, be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, thou and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed of their looks, though 
they be a rebellious house. You think that you are in a difficult situation, but look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel was living among scorpions. That is, the children of Israel were described as thorns, briars, scorpions. And yet Ezekiel was told, you have a ministry, you have something to carry out among the rebellious house of the children of Israel. Verse 7. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. The Lord was saying, Ezekiel, don't even think about it. Will they accept sound doctrine, sound teaching, balanced word of God? Don't think about it. Will they rebel? Don't think about it. Will they submit? Don't think about it. Will they appreciate you? Don't think about it. Preach that word. Even though they will be rebellious, preach the word. Ezekiel chapter 3 from verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat it, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel. And speak my words unto them. Ezekiel was a man that ate the word. Ate the word. Swallowed the word. Enjoyed the word. If you go on in the life of Ezekiel, you will see the various descriptions that are given about him. And when I say we need an Ezekiel today, in every community of this continent... I'm talking about having a man with power, a man with anointing, a man having the mighty hand of God upon him, a man that is filled and completely controlled by the Spirit of God, a man who is so saturated with the divine message that nothing else seems to matter to him, a man that is characterized by supernatural boldness, who does not fear to declare the truth of redemption, whether people will accept or reject. A man possessing divine interpretation for all human actions. We need an Ezekiel in every community today. And I believe that as you are here, you will consecrate yourself to the Lord. And say, Lord, make me an Ezekiel. Lord, make me and Ezekiel. God is looking for a man. Ezekiel chapter 22. Verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that I should make up, that should make up the edge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. You wonder why people are destroyed, why they are judged, why they are not saved. God is seeking for an Ezekiel. I pray that in your own community, he will find you faithful. An Ezekiel in every community is all we need. I want you to think about it like this. In the 50 countries in Africa south of the Sahara, we have about... 500 million people. If you were to have just one person that will be totally consecrated to the Lord, totally abandoned to the Lord, empowered by the Lord, energized by the Lord, anointed by the Lord, if you have one person that receives the word of God and he doesn't care for anything but the word of God alone, if you have one person that has the hand of God upon him, you have one person that says, all I care for is to turn this community of mine to the Lord. 
one person for a million people. All you need in the whole of Africa will be 500 people. One person for a million. 500 people for 500 million people. But they will not be ordinary people. They will not be ordinary churchgoers. They will not be people that just read the Bible and forget what they read. They will not be people that read the Bible and are not moved to tears and moved to prayer. They will not be people that hear the word of God but it has no place in their hearts. They will not be people that are preaching but are not able to do what they are preaching. They will be people that are drunk on the word of God, saturated with the word of God. They will be people of one vision, one life, one ministry, one mission. There will be people that will say, Oh Lord, these people, I know they can live if you give me the chance just among these one million people. And here we are today. We we'll count more than 500. But you know, God is not looking for 500 ordinary people. 500 saved people. It's good to be saved. There are many saved people that are empty handed going to heaven. It's wonderful to be saved. There are many people that are saved, that have been spawn fed all the time, all the years of their lives. There are many people that are saved, they are not drinking and eating and swallowing the word of God. There are many people that are saved, but they are not concerned, they are not weeping and crying. They are not on their knees interceding for the people that are perishing. There are many people that are saved. There are many people that are even saying they are sanctified. But they do not have the burden of the lost world upon them. If we could get 500 people, and if we could get 5,000, think about it. Think about it. If we could get 5,000 people just like Ezekiel, we could speed, hurry up the coming of the Lord. I mean, if we could get 5,000 people of all of us that are here, 5,000 people, and you say, I don't care for any other thing anymore now, this community where the Lord has brought me in the midst of dead bones and dry bones and dismembered bones, oh Lord, give me a chance and give me the anointing to do the work like Ezekiel. All those people will come alive. And the reason we come together this week, we didn't come here to just celebrate and rejoice. We come here to be fired up. We come here to see what we have not done, what we should have done. We come here not just to fellowship, not just to rejoice, not just to say what a wonderful thing, not just to say what a big thing deeper life has become. Look at all the nations represented. We didn't come here for that. We came here to see. Look at the dead bones. Look at the dry bones. Look at the people that are perishing. Look at the people that have not been saved. And say, Lord, I volunteer. I'll be an Ezekiel. Even though briars and thorns and scorpions are all around me, I'll be an Ezekiel. Even though rebellious people all surround me, I'll be an Ezekiel. Even though the people may even fight against me and fight against the world, I'll be an Ezekiel. An Ezekiel for the Lord. Is it possible? I said, is it possible? You know, our coming together this week will be a waste if God cannot trace up in every nation in Africa and Ezekiel. If you cannot go back and speak to those dead bones and dry bones and life begins to come immediately, this conference will be a waste. If you cannot go back and preach every day, preach two or three times every day, preach in the morning, preach in the night, preach in the day, if you cannot go back and shake your community for the Lord, if you cannot go back and say dead dry bones, hear the word of the Lord, this conference will be a waste. If all the women that are here, you come to this congress, and when you go back, you go back to the same old kitchen, and you are there all the day through, this conference will be a waste. If all the men here will go back to their trade, and you go back to all your enterprises 
and it's the same old story. It will be a waste if we go back after this Congress and you go back to that little church of 20 and that little church of 30 and that little church of 25 and when we're going to come next year, Jesus tarries, we say praise the Lord where the faithful few people of God, the 25 people are still there, the people are so hard-hearted, they are not changing, they are not repenting, they are but we're still 25, but we praise the Lord, we 25 people were sticking together and the people are rejecting, but praise the Lord, we're a little group, but we're the the people of God, it will be a waste. But this time, if you'll pray in the day and pray in the night, if you'll cry in the day and cry in the night, if you'll talk to the Lord about the dead bones, about the dry bones, if you'll say, Oh Lord, make me an Ezekiel, well, you may not know what that means because it means much, but the Lord will answer that prayer. He'll make you an Ezekiel. And your community will never be the same anymore in Jesus' name. But it's going to take a decision of heart. It's going to take a commitment, a consecration, saying, Oh Lord, I am going to be an Ezekiel for the Lord. Let's go back to that Ezekiel chapter 37. And read it now from verse 4. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to come into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring of flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7 is so important. So I prophesied as I was commanded. So I prophesied as I was commanded. So I prophesied as I was commanded. The problem with the preachers of the world today is that they change the message. They do not preach. They do not prophesy as the Lord has commanded in the world. But Ezekiel said, I prophesied as I was commanded. If you are going to make any change in this end time era, you are going to prophesy and to preach as you are commanded. Not only that, he was told to prophesy to the wind. That is to say, come. Thou, from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. He then said, so I prophesied in verse 10, as I was commanded, he was, that was prayer. What were the two things that God used in Ezekiel or through Ezekiel? Proclamation and supplication. Proclamation. He preached the word. The power of preaching is still the greatest of human instrumentalities today. There is no substitute. Ezekiel was given the message he was to deliver, and he dared not preach any other. The problem today is that there are people that are modifying the message, adjusting the message, and they are cutting the message down to feed the audience they are trying to preach to. Had Ezekiel preached any other message, punishment from God would have been severely inflicted upon him. Not only that, there would have been no miracle of regeneration and resurrection. What if a preacher preaches any other gospel today than what is revealed in God's word? He exposes himself to unbearable punishment and it will be of no value in saving souls. Not only that, Ezekiel prayed. That's supplication. Ezekiel was to pray. He was to prophesy to the wind. That means he was to plead for the Spirit of God to breathe upon these slain that they may live. And he prayed. And from heaven came the power of God that brought life upon those dead, dry bones. Our words will be powerless unless they are made powerful by God's mighty spirit i then plead with you this year and for the rest of your ministry on earth let there be earnest prayer with passionate preaching 
if you are to expect the miracle of life in your dead communities. Point three, raising up an end time army. Raising up an end time army. In verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army, an exceeding great army. I said before that our urgent need is an Ezekiel, but not an Ezekiel that will stand alone, but an Ezekiel, a man so possessed by God, in every community, in every region, in every nation in this continent of Africa and beyond, a man so possessed by God, who can raise up an end time army for an end time mission. What kind of army? Number one, an army of loyal, obedient soldiers of Christ who hate sin and whose consuming passion is to destroy sin wherever it is found. And I challenge you as you go back to your various localities and to your various nations that you will know that God has set you up and God has raised you up in that community. Not just to preach the usual sermon every Sunday, not just to sing the usual song every meeting day. Not just to do, you, not to do the usual thing in the usual way the Lord has raised you up. To raise an army of loyal, obedient soldiers of Christ. Not just have members. Not just have people that can attend church. Not just have people to join deeper life. Not just have people to say I'm one of them. To raise up an army of loyal, obedient soldiers of Christ who hate sin and whose consuming passion is to destroy sin wherever it is found. It's going to mean that they will not compromise with sin. If they see sin in themselves, they will be brutal against it. If they see sin in their relatives, very near to them, they will be very decidedly opposed to that sin. And if they see sin in the church in which they belong, they will deal with that sin, raise up such an army. Number two, an army of single-minded disciples of Christ. Not people that have a hundred, a thousand things they want to achieve. But an army of single-minded disciples of Christ whose only goal is to convert and conquer their territory for Christ. Are those the kinds of people who are raising up an army for the Lord? I challenge you that as you go back, I challenge you that as you return from this Congress, you will go back to your various communities and regions and nations and you will say, my purpose in ministry now is not just to entertain people, it's not to please people, it's not to tickle the ears of people, it's not to make people make myself accepted, interesting to people. It is to develop an army of single-minded disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose only goal will be to convert and conquer this whole territory for the Lord. Number three, an army of mighty warriors. Warriors for the Lord. Not people who cannot fight sin, fight Satan, fight disease, fight, fight everything and anything that's contrary to the will and word of God. An army of mighty warriors who are fearless in fighting the good fight of faith in the face of the greatest dangers. That's the work of God. The Lord has not called us just to preach. Many people are preaching. Jehovah's Witnesses preach. Catholics preach. Anglicans preach. Many people preach. We're talking about doing something for God in this time of the end. We're talking about raising up mighty warriors who are very bold and fearless in fighting that good fight of faith in the face of every danger and of the greatest dangers. Number four, an army of trained soldiers. You know, a soldier may be a soldier, he's been recruited and he even wears the uniform, but he's not trained. He doesn't know how to use the weapons of warfare. But you want to go back 
and you want to make up your mind that you want to be an Ezekiel for the Lord and raise up an army of trained soldiers who know how to use heaven's weapon of warfare effectively to deliver souls from Satan's captivity. If our preaching does not deliver souls from captivity, what kind of preaching is that? If our preaching does not disturb people, make people uncomfortable, judge them, and get them out of the pit of the captivity of the devil, if our preaching does not make them to arise and to say, I'm for Satan no more, I'm for bad habits no more, I'm for evil no more, I'm giving myself completely unto the Lord. What kind of preaching will that be? Go back then and raise up an army of trained soldiers who will use the weapons of warfare effectively to deliver souls from Satan's captivity. Number five, let's go back and raise up an army of tireless fighters. We have too many people that preach for one week and then they are tired. We have too many people that preach for one year and then they are tired. We have people that preach for just a season and then they are tired. Why don't we make up our minds that if we're going to be the Ezekiel of God in our own community in this generation, we're going to be able to raise up an army of people, army of tireless fighters who battle for souls until everyone in the community has surrendered unto our Lord. As long as there is still somebody opposed to the Lord, not surrendered to the Lord, not yielded to the Lord, not born again, in that community, he keeps on fighting. He keeps on evangelizing. He keeps on distributing truck. He keeps on doing everything that he ought to do until the very last one of the enemies of the cross have come to the Lord, surrendering unto the Lord. Number six, raise up an army of serious, sober people who are fervent in spirit, born in conviction, steadfast in commitment, and have thrown and have thrown all jesting idleness, time-wasting activities behind them. You see, it, it will be a wonderful thing. If you can go back and say, oh Lord, I want to be an Ezekiel in this community. And these are dead bones. And I want to take them from the point of deadness and dryness. And I want to take them to the point where they have the life of Christ, the life of God in them. Not only that they have the life of God in them, they are now so committed unto the Lord. They are serious and sober. They are fervent in spirit. We have too many lukewarm people in the church. Wake them up. We have too many people in the church who are neither here nor there. Wake them up. And let us go and develop an army of serious, sober-minded people who are fervent in spirit, who are burning in conviction, who are steadfast in commitment, and who are thrown behind them, all jesting, all idleness, all time-wasting activities. Number seven. As you are depending upon the Lord to make you so feel like an Ezekiel, you want to commit yourself to the Lord, throw yourself into the very hands of the Lord so that he will use you to develop, to raise up an army of faithful, daring, dedicated people. That is, those who can take risk for the Lord. Those who can endanger their lives for the Lord. Those who can be daring in the battle of the Lord. Faithful, faithful, daring, dedicated people who would rather die than deny a jot, a little part of the word of their master. They will defend that word with their own blood. They will defend that word giving up everything that needs to be given up so that they will commit themselves to the world without turning aside. Number eight, an army of surrendered, yielded servants who will give up all their possession and will give up their very life to finish the unfinished task. There are many people that are stopping before the work is finished. And we need to go back and raise up an army, end time army, that will finish the unfinished task. If that is to be done, 
you yourself will have to lead the way. You yourself will have to be a model, an example to the people. And you will be a surrendered, yielded vessel yourself. And then will it be possible for you in the hand of God to raise up an army of surrendered, yielded servants who will give up everything they have and give up their very life so they can finish the unfinished task. Number nine. Raise up an army of disciplined Christians. Disciplined Christians. There are many churches that the people are waiting for the church to discipline them. There is no self-discipline. There is no Holy Ghost discipline. There is no spiritual discipline that a person brings upon himself. Like John Wesley. Like Martin Luther. Like just Charles G. Finney, like a lot of all those giants of faith in this contemporary time, in these centuries just gone, the people that were so disciplined themselves as to how they spend their time, as to where they go, as to what they eat, as to what friends they have, as to the things they get involved with. But many people are waiting for church discipline today before they can sit up and before they can do the right thing. Why don't we go back? and reorientate the people and lead the people and let them not wait for church discipline let there be holy ghost discipline and self-discipline let them be disciplined by scripture an army of disciplined christians who deny themselves of legitimate needs of life to serve the lord the people that will voluntarily, voluntarily, voluntarily deny themselves of legitimate needs of life to serve the Lord. Number 10. Let's go back and raise up an army of bold, courageous soldiers of Christ who are not terrified by threats, by persecution, or by the might of opposing forces. Oh yes, opposing religions are there. Opposing forces are there. People are there to speak against the cross of Christ. And to speak against salvation in the Lord. Why don't we go back and commit ourselves to the Lord. And raise up bold, courageous soldiers of Christ. Who are not terrified at all by the threats or the persecution or the might of the opposing forces. 11. An army of enduring warriors who overlook the wounds and the afflictions while doing the master's will as if there were no other concern in life. You see, there are so many of our people, they are disturbed by the little pebbles of criticism. They are disturbed by the little problems they have in their little families. They are disturbed by the little, little things happening around them. And they will say, well, look at what I'm going through. Look at what I have. Look at this. Look at that. Let's go back and commit ourselves. Raising up a, 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 an army of committed people. People that never complain. I mean, if we say we're born again, what does being born again mean? If we say we're sanctified, what does being sanctified, what does that mean? An army of people that never complain of too much work. Too much responsibility, too much preaching, too much assignment, too much field, too much extent, too much, uh, uh, too much field that they are to evangelize. An army of people that will never complain. Even when they are wounded, even when they have affliction, even when they have any problem. An army of enduring warriors who overlook the wounds and the afflictions while they are doing the master's will as if there were no other concern in life. Number 12. Why don't we go back? And during this period, why don't we make up our minds that I'm here for just this one week. And this one week will not be for play. It will not be for just socializing. It will not be for greeting this and greeting that. It will not be for wasting all the time we have on things that are not essential. I'm saying people are dying. And the communities that we represent, they are dead, dry bones. And something needs to be done. Why don't you then say all through this week, I'm going to just wait upon the Lord. And so that when I go back, 
the Lord will use me to raise up, number 12, an army of orderly soldiers, not unruly soldiers, not people that cannot keep their rank, orderly soldiers, keeping to divine order, even at the heat of the battle, that the Lord will use you to raise up a set of people that if they are supposed to be standing there, staying there, sitting there, preaching there, they will stand at their post. Not people who are here and they are designing another thing over there. Not people who are supposed to be in this locality and their minds are over there that God will use you to raise up. An army of orderly soldiers keeping to divine order even at the time of the heat of the battle, 13. That God will use you to raise up an army of united soldiers who keep united at all costs, even in the midst of lies and insinuations of enemy strategists wanting to cause disunity and defeat. Oh yes, that's the strategy of the devil. He will try to cause disunity so that your hands will be weakened or the hands of your people in the community will be weakened. But you want to raise up an army of united soldiers who will keep united at all costs, fighting the, fight, the good fight of faith and doing battle for the Lord and doing the work of the Lord, even though there may be enemies that bring in insinuations and lies. Number 14... An army of militant guards. Guards. An army of militant guards who jealously guard the faith once delivered unto the saints more than they guard their very lives. An army of people that are jealously watching over this faith, this word, this doctrine, this truth once delivered unto the saints that will not allow a wife, an husband, a friend, a neighbor, a religious man, anyone to tamper with the faith once delivered unto the saints. We need an Ezekiel. We're looking for Ezekiels. This church cannot move anywhere without Ezekiels. People that are totally consumed. People that have no other thing they are thinking about. Men and women that will say, I see my community. I see our people. I see many people that they are not saved yet. I see the whole thing is dry. And I know God can make a change. I know the problem is not the dry bone, not the dead bone. The problem is me. I have not fully surrendered to be an Ezekiel. But the time has come. We have played enough. We have discussed enough. We have done a lot of other things enough. It's time to serve the Lord. God can raise up people like John Wesley again. He can raise up people like Charles G. Finney again. Can he not? Can you be that man? Can you be that woman? We need you. The Lord needs you. Africa is dying. The whole nation, the whole continent is dying. Sinking deep into hell. Son of man, daughter of man, can these bones live? Answer with your life. Rise up and let us pray. We came here to this Congress and we mean business. We want to serve the Lord. We want to prepare for end time ministry and mission. Can't you do something?
in this generation at this time people are perishing souls are dying Africa is like a big valley of dead dry bones we need an Ezekiel men 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 what will you do we need an Ezekiel women are you not going to be involved let the fire of God drop in your soul don't let the word you have heard condemn you on the last day aren't you concerned that souls are perishing God needs an Ezekiel in every community he needs an Ezekiel in every community. He needs an Ezekiel in every nation, in every region. He needs an Ezekiel everywhere. Why don't you surrender your life to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. We came to this Congress so we can be set on fire. We didn't come to play. We didn't come to socialize. We came so that God can raise you up on Ezekiel. That something will be done. Heaven's fire will come upon your soul, come upon the altar of your heart. Ezekiel was a man on fire for God. Be an Ezekiel for God. Let your life count for the ministry. Let your life count for the conversion of people. Let your life count for a kind of ministry that will get sent souls to heaven. Let all the days of the Congress be days when you are fully, completely surrendered to the Lord. Saying, O oh Lord, make an Ezekiel out of me. O oh Lord, make an Ezekiel out of me. Don't allow side attractions to distract you.